Welcome to an all new episode of In The Future Podcast. I'm Steve Factor. Let me tell you a story. So I had some friends over my house for the holidays. I know, ooh, COVID, <laughs> can't have friends. It was a lovely time until I got into this heated debate with a friend of mine over free speech. If you've listened to any of my episodes, I'm a big fan. And he goes to me, you know what? I don't think it's that important. A lot of other societies do well without it. And I'm like, not this one. And so I started laying on all of my best arguments for free speech. Look at all the comedians that are being canceled. People can't say what they want. Movies are being edited because people don't want certain scenes in them anymore. Or they're being pulled entirely. Whole episodes are being pulled. And then at work, they're creating all these tripwires. You can't even talk like a regular person to people anymore. People are being canceled or not hired for things they said 10 years ago in a tweet when they were 12. And it is going to affect you. He did not care at all. In fact, he's like, hey, if everything goes to shit here, I'll just move back to India. And I was infuriated. So I immediately called ICE and had him deported. I'm sure he'll be fine, I think. Regardless, I'm thinking, what kind of fair weather citizen did we let in here? And by the way, I don't mind telling you this was an Indian friend of mine because I have so many Indian friends that statistically you would have no way of narrowing it down. Coming out of that debate, I was convinced a dual citizenship is the arch enemy of patriotism. And divided loyalties aren't real loyalties. An ambivalent citizen is a lesser citizen. And a dual citizen is basically a tourist. Tourists have no stakes. They're not patriots. They're not going to defend the values of the country. They've got one foot out the door. They're ready to get out at any time. It's like that employee who comes in late every day, drifts off in meetings, and then tweets the rest of the afternoon. Sounds familiar. And I say all this as an immigrant who didn't have that option to leave. But I also have a lot of friends and family who do have that option and don't want to give it up. But that option is exactly the problem, or so I thought. So I slept on this. Not literally, I slept in a bed. But when I woke up, I realized that there are two conflicting sides in my head. The first side is the libertarian side, where competition is good, options are good. When you have options, People try harder. Everyone tries harder. And why shouldn't we be able to choose the country that suits our needs the best? But then there's also the other side, which is the marriage side of me, which is relationships are hard. Commitments are hard. You can't make them completely frictionless and completely transactional. On Tinder, everyone's disposable. You could just get a new one every day. It's like a date dispenser where you pull a new one out to pull you off each day. Countries, like relationships, are difficult. Liberties are hard to win, but they're even harder to maintain because over time you stop caring, you start letting things go. Before you know it, your socks are on the couch, you wreck your first Lincoln, and your Viking helmet is on Nancy Pelosi's desk. But the question is, should we artificially make it that way, like we did with marriage? You create all these tough laws to make it hard to separate, and yeah, maybe it keeps some people together, or maybe it keeps them at their throats. Shouldn't we be like employers and employees where it's at will? When you're done with that relationship, each party can just move on. And realistically, a lot of people aren't going back to their godforsaken war-torn lands. I'm not going back to Ukraine anytime soon. I'm not eating a pickle sandwich ever again. In fact, I'm not touching another gherkin unless I'm getting paid for it. I don't even know if Ukraine has pickle sandwiches. I don't even know if they have bread, to be honest with you. It's been that long and I care that little. But that's the thing. What's gotten lost in all of this is obligations. JFK famously said, Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. If JFK was running for office today, <laughs> that would be pretty impressive. But if he were around, his speech would sound completely different. It would be, Ask not what you can do for your country. Ask what your country can do for you. That's what politicians are doing. They're promising us the world. Never mind that they're not delivering it. They're like crackheads underneath the bridge. Okay, I might have to cut that out. So what is a citizen's obligation to a country? 
or to other citizens. Like I think about how few of my friends served in the military. We don't know what it's like to sacrifice to get the freedoms that we have. Other countries are not like this. You go to Israel, everyone, men, women, everyone has to serve in the military. And if you don't show up, they hummus board you. That's right, it's like waterboarding, but with bad hummus. That's part of the deal. That's how the country stays a country. Is paying taxes enough? I don't know, maybe, doesn't feel like it. And what is a country's obligation to its citizens? Some think it should be free housing and healthcare and education, daycare, drug treatment, universal basic income. It's a pretty long list. And then you have people on the other side that say, just protect property and liberty and we're done. That's the difference between buying a Big Mac and eating the guy who serves it to you and his whole family. And even if we miraculously sat down and agreed on what this country should stand for, what our obligations to each other should be, what if the country doesn't fulfill those obligations? What recourse do you have? You're gonna go to Mexico, you're gonna climb over the big beautiful wall, you're gonna go to Europe where they don't want you, they're not looking for immigrants. Maybe you can go to Mars with Elon Musk and his weird girlfriend and his hieroglyphic daughter. What are you gonna talk about for three years as you're flying to Mars? How you made your billions? And what happens if we're too dumb to save? A friend of mine was telling me about these attacks on synagogues that worry her and the rise of all of these anti-Semites. She's got a passport to Israel. Do I tell her not to go? Hey, stay here. Fight for what? With whom? And why? She's free to go and maybe she should if she doesn't feel comfortable anymore. And what if you're a loser citizen who doesn't fulfill your obligations to the country? What recourse does the country have? Send you to a gulag, a TikTok house, to intern for Tiger King? And then I have to face up to my own hypocrisy. I escaped New York City in the middle of the pandemic. And my friends are like, oh no, you gotta stay. New York needs you. It needs you to get robbed and mugged and stabbed. Why? I've lived through New York in the 80s and 90s when it was horrible, when it was dangerous, when we had 10% unemployment. I've paid my dues. I don't feel like doing that again. You've got an imbecile mayor. You've got a governor who is drunk on power and ego. They're putting in all these nonsensical rules. They're destroying small businesses. They're destroying all the things I loved about New York. They can't even hand out vaccines properly. Why should I stay? And on top of that, uh, Cuomo's getting an Emmy or a Grammy or something. He, he's getting an award that doesn't exist for pretending to be a governor on TV. He's this close to singing Yellow Submarine with Gal Gadot. Gadot? Gadot or Gadot? Somebody please help. So do I stay or do I go? I went. So here I sit, a dirty little hypocrite. So then I thought back to that night, that conversation with my friend, frustrated. I was like, is there any principle or value that you would actually defend? We both agreed on racism, against it, not for it, you monsters. So we came up with this example. Let's say you managed to escape some horrible war-torn country and you float on a boat where after eating your entire family, clearly. But listen, who's judging? No, I'm kidding, that wasn't part of it. You're the only survivor. You land on this beautiful, idyllic island. It's got all the natural resources you love or need. Turns out there are 100 residents on this island. 99 of them are racists. One person, not of that race, is getting the crap kicked out of them. They have all the worst jobs. They get abused and demeaned. They have to pick up all the dung everywhere on the island. You thought your Tinder experience was bad? His Tinder is actual Tinder. So what do you do? The best strategy is to blend in, to be likable, to be useful, to help out, not to stand out, but are you gonna watch this person get abused? So I asked my friend, what would you do? And he's like, look, if I just let them kill him, I could lead a pretty good life on this island. There wouldn't be any trouble. And I said, hmm, what an interesting way of standing up against racism. 
that's pretty much how OJ stood up against the knife industry or Phil Spector stood up against gun violence. So my friend asked me, well, what would you do? I thought about it for a second. I'm like, look, realistically, I'm not going to do anything by brute force. If I try to stand up and get all, you know, social justice they're just going to kill me. And they're going to continue doing what they are doing to this other guy and might kill him too. So in that case, nobody wins. The cause doesn't get advanced and the racists win. So I would probably take the approach that Daryl Davis did. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a black blues musician who recently wrote a book about his experience converting, I think it was like 22 clan members and they left the clan and he actually collected their robes. And all he did was befriend them. He showed them that their stereotypes were wrong just by being a warm hearted, open, smart person. It was this amazing story. That's something that I would seek to do. I would try to model the kind of behavior and kindness towards this person as much as I could and help them see the humanity of this other person. Unfortunately, that probably also means that I won't accomplish this mission in my lifetime. I will die and racism on that island will still live. But I'll probably have been able to convert two, three, four, five people and maybe get 10 others to at least question their beliefs or be kinder or see that maybe their way is not the best way. And then the next generation will be kinder and better. That's how it progresses. I will have moved the ball down the field way more than if I had tried force because force only gets people to dig in deeper and to fight harder. You end up creating an enemy, not an ally. You increase the chance that your cause will fail. Then I started thinking a little bit deeper about the values of a country. Those values aren't much different from religion. But what happens when people in that country no longer believe? And it's not just immigrants. It's everybody. We no longer share those common values. Does the faith die? Does the country die? And maybe I'm just fooling myself. Maybe free speech doesn't matter. Maybe democracy doesn't matter because I'm surrounded by all kinds of people who are happy with undemocratic means to get what they want. That's not principle, but very common now. So am I just lying to myself? Maybe I'm just like everybody else, conjuring my own enemies, creating my own causes just to give my life meaning. Maybe there is no meaning here. But for now, I think I'm going to cling to those beliefs and those values because it's what got me here. It's what served as a lifeline for all of the others who came here. This was an oasis. And you know what? It still is. You would think because of all the infighting and all the protests and riots and all this other stuff that people would have stopped. They haven't. You look at the numbers from 2019, no other country even comes close. People are choosing America. They are voting with their moccasins and their Uggs and their flip-flops and their thongs, hopefully their thongs, stilettos, all the good shoes. And they're still coming here. The only other countries that even make a blip on that chart import slave labor, like these countries in the Middle East where you have no chance of becoming a citizen. The world has voted. And it voted for us, even though we're not voting for us. This country has assimilated more people over the years than any other nation, including me, although I still occasionally dress like a tablecloth. The U.S. is truly different. The biggest difference is this isn't an ethno state. It's not where your bloodline determines your destiny. Here, excellence and ideas determine your destiny. It hasn't always been that way, but it certainly is now. Even the biggest bigot in the world has to take your call if you can make him money. We have religious freedom. We have more innovation than any other country. We give more to charity than any other country. And as far as I know, we're the only country in history to ever rebuild its enemies. We rebuilt Germany and Japan and Italy after World War II. Every other nation, historically, and even today, when they win a war, they're raping and pillaging their conquests. I don't even know what pillaging means, but just based on the raping, I can tell it's probably pretty bad.
We're not doing any of that. And the crazy thing is, at this moment, we need people more than ever. China is about to become the biggest market in the world. And whether we like it or not, this world, I'm not even talking about this country, this world is a capitalist world. China just happened to do it without democracy. They did it with oppression. And I can tell you, you will not want to live in a world with Chinese values. The problem is money talks. When they become the biggest market, their values will dominate and corporations will be the enforcers of those values. You can already see that with Hollywood capitulating to China, which is their growing market. Same thing with Nike, same thing with NBA. That is the future. So the only way to combat it is to massively expand our market. That means birth incentives. That means immigration. But how do you invite people over without putting away your sex toys? America's a mess. We've got dildos scattered all over the floor. We've got to clean this up before we bring people in. And we do need to bring them in. Because once we're a small player in a big world, I don't think you're going to want to live under those new rules. This is one day where I can't pretend to have all the answers. All I have is questions. Who are we? What are our values? Which ones are we still willing to fight for? Do citizens who put in nothing deserve everything? And do countries that fail its citizens deserve patriotism? And should I have my ungrateful friends deported? These are the questions. And talking about all of this reminds me of the prescient words of Yuri Bezmenov. Just like me, Yuri is a Soviet dissident. Unlike me, he was a propaganda chief for the KGB. And he gave this prescient interview in 1984. And what he said there was, Russia and the communists never expected to defeat the United States in some sort of military uh, conflict. We have too many defenses. We have too strong a military. But the seeds of what is necessary to divide us and destroy us from within are right here. He warned us about having generations of kids never being taught the basic fundamentals of Americanism. And we're paying that price right now. Nobody knows what our values should be. And there's a lot of hatred and resentment and anger towards the country. Some of it may be justified, but a lot of it is our failure to reinforce those values and deliver on them. I'll leave you with these words from Yuri Bezmenov. The, the time bomb is ticking. With every second, the disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to. Unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. This is it. This is the last country of freedom and, and possibility. There's no other place left to defect to. That's it for this episode. Don't forget to sign up for the Patreon, sign up for the newsletter, support the show, and share it with others. I'm Steve Factor. See you next time on The McFuture. It kind of reminded me of New York City. I've been feeling this for like the last, I don't know, five to 10 years in New York, where everyone is basically a tourist. They milk the city for, you know, fun and entertainment, live there three to five years, have a corporate job, get to call themselves New Yorkers, and then just disappear. They've invested nothing. Yeah, they've paid taxes, but they don't set roots there. They don't build real communities. It's just a transactional type of relationship. And all these tourists are driving up prices for the ones who stayed. And yeah, there's still the restaurants and the concerts and the comedy clubs, but keeping me in New York is way too much pressure to put on Carrot Top, my favorite comedian. And now we have a country exactly like that, where no one commits because, hey, we can leave at any time. And certainly that's how I felt about my friend. No, really, that's the greatest impression ever, right? I mean, it's amazing.